Cross Life Broadcasting Taking the Gospel Around the World Good to go. All right. Welcome to those that are joining us by live stream today. Amen. We'd love for you to come out if you're able to be with us in person. Sometimes sickness or distance prevents that, but we're glad to have you with us today. Amen. I got an encouraging word for you today, uh, and uh, I believe we're going to be changed by it. Second Corinthians chapter number 4, verse number 1 is where I want to begin. Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. But what we proclaim is not ourselves. Paul says, we don't proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then, here's our main scripture this morning. But we have this treasure in jars of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Lord, I pray for the anointing of God, and I pray for your help and blessing upon the Word. Anoint us today that we may glorify you and do your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You can be seated in the house of the Lord this morning. The, the, the message that I want to preach to you today, the Lord willing, is the treasure has got to come out. Now, I believe that uh, uh, we needed an encouraging word this morning. Uh, I felt that in my spirit, and uh, uh, I, I know that this has been a rough year for some of us. And in fact, even as a church, and we'll maybe address that a little bit later on, but all of us know what it's like to go through tests and trials and storms. All of us know what it's like to go through seasons of our life where we look up and wonder, God, what in the world are you doing? God, if you loved me, you could have stopped this. God, if you loved me, you could have kept this from happening. God, if you loved this, you could have had this happen. Anybody ever been there and thought, God, I, what, I, what more do I need to do? I, I do what I live for you. I love you. I, I support the church with my attendance and tithe. I try to live a, a right life. I read my Bible. I pray. But yet, God, I do all of that, and you still allow this to happen to me. I think we all have been at a place like that probably multiple times in our lives. There are several different schools of thought as to how trials and storms come into our lives. And a lot of times when something bad happens to us, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't tend, when sometimes it gets to the place, as I said just a moment ago, but other times when other bad things are happening to other people and we're trying to explain it away because whether we realize it or not, we're afraid that God's going to look bad by what happened. And so we try to gloss it over and say, well, you know, God didn't have anything to do with that. And, and that was just the devil and all that. There's all these different types of views as to why storms and how they test and trials come into our life. We have to understand that even... Uh, that when we read the Bible, uh, all the stories that we get inspiration from and power and revelation from, that we live in a much more civilized time today. As hard as life may get sometimes and as tough as trials may go, we live in a pretty safe, secure, and civilized time compared to the vast majority of the history of the human race. We have spiritualized what was literal life and death for people back in the Bible. 
And, and, and so if they could get encouraged, if they could get through things we could, that would literally kill them, uh, I think we can get through things that affect us spiritually. Now, as I said, there's different rules of thought. How in the world and why in the world do all kinds of trials and suffering come? Number one, there's a view that the devil is the one that is solely responsible for all the bad that happens in this world. And can I tell you, I do believe that the devil is the source uh, of the bad, bad that goes on. Sin and the devil and all that. Um, but uh, I want to I pose you a question this morning. The devil is not all powerful. The devil is not all knowing. The devil cannot do anything that God does not allow. And so even if the devil is the source of things, even if the devil is the one that causes the evil and causes the bad, and really most of the time it's probably not even him that causes it, he just dangles before us the desires of our heart and we run with it and cause the problem the rest of the way. Uh, but it, the only way that can happen is if God allows it. The only way it can happen is if God does not intervene. And then there's people that believe that God may sometimes uh, orchestrate, that God only does and authors what's good in our life, but sometimes He allows uh, bad things to happen uh, because he wants to test and try us and that's kind of a middle of the ground road, road if middle of the road view you got this view over here that says the devil is 100% the blame and then you got the middle ground that says well you know God's not the blame for the bad but sometimes God allows it to happen but really if God allows it to happen is God still not in control he's in control by allowing it to happen is what I want you to see that. There's the other extreme that would say that God authors or, or designs or directs everything. I want to tell you whether God authors it or whether God allows it or whether God doesn't in, intervene. What that really means is that everything that happens in your life, both good and bad, God is in control of it. Now that can be offensive to some people because we think, well, if God is loving and if God is just and if God is merciful, if God is good, why in the world would he allow or cause something bad or hurtful to come into the life of his creation? That's the wrong way of looking at it this morning. And what I want to get you to see, hopefully, at the end of this is a different perspective on things. Whether God does not intervene, as I said, or whether He doesn't prevent, or whether He offers it, it all points to His power, His control, and His authority over all things. In essence, nothing good or bad happens without God. That means... You know why that's encouraging to me? That means that everything has a purpose. There's nothing worse than purposeless suffering. To go through a trial or a hardship or a suffering for no reason at all. To me, there would be nothing worse than that, that to go through pain and it not have any meaning. But if God is in control of it all, that means everything in your life God has a purpose and a plan and a reason for it. Sometimes the purpose is beyond our understanding. There are some things that we will never understand in this life. No matter how hard we try, no matter how much we think about it, there are some things that to us just won't ever make sense. Sometimes it's beyond our understanding because His ways are not our ways and His thoughts are not our thoughts. You need to realize that what you went through and what you faced, it may not have even really had anything to do with you. It may have really been there to set in motion something that is going to happen two generations 
from now. Every choice and decision that you make or that I make, there's a cause and their effect. There's millions and billions of choices and effect, causes and effect that are happening in this world today all across the globe, setting things in motion. And the decisions that I make today, no matter how insignificant or small as they may seem, affect my great, 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 great grandchildren down the road. And so that blows my mind and I, I, I can't understand and I most likely uh, unless they all have babies really young will not be around when I get great 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 grandbabies one day but God already knows the future. He knows their destiny. He knows of their plan. Amen. There are people that did things that nobody ever knew their name but they were the one that poured into the life of somebody like a Billy Graham or a, a Jonathan Edwards that were able to affect thousands, hundreds of thousands of people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what you're going through today might not even be about God's plan for you. It might be setting something in motion that's going to be coming down the road. Ultimately, you need to realize that everything God does, God does for the purpose of glorifying himself. That's what the scripture tells us. That all things are for the glory of God. Amen. There's a purpose that God, a treasure that God has on the inside of us. The Bible tells us that God is glorified in his creation. God's glorified in you. Man or woman, boy or girl today, good looking, rich, poor, whatever, short, tall, dark and handsome, and or just dark, you know, or uh, whatever, red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in His sight. No matter who we are, no matter what race or creed or ethnicity, God is glorified in you because you are made in the image of God. But God is not only glorified in His creation, God is glorified in the redemption and the transformation of His creation. God has chosen to, God loved you so much and wanted enough for the purpose of His glory that God sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. That if we would believe on Him crucified, believe on Him buried, believe on Him raised from the dead, that God could take us out of our sinful nature, our corrupt flesh, and change us into something better that is what gives God the glory that he can take something that's broken and put it back together again that he can take something that's nasty and putrid and corrupt and created a new creature that God has redeemed you from the curse of the law the curse of sin and of death God is glorified in our redemption and in our transformation too many times, what, what and who we are falls short of the glory that God has destined for us. Amen? I believe it was Isaiah, Isaiah 53, that says, All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. We all have messed up. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all have done things that if we were judged on what we have done and what we haven't done, that we would not warrant or deserve to be used by God. Listen, Daniel Gamble don't deserve in himself to stand behind this pulpit today. In fact, none of us within ourselves even deserve to be in this house this morning. If the, if the justice of God was poured out on us, our just deserves, we would have been struck dead the moment we walked into the house, his house. But God has showed forth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, while we are still imperfect and while we still have falls, he died for us and we can boldly approach the throne of mercy. Amen. We, but we all fall short even after we get saved from what God has destined us. Not only our physical bodies fall short, but our, our character, our nature falls short. It, it's got sin in it. It's corrupt. We are decidedly earthly. 
when we were created for the glories of the heavens. Amen. We're going to see that in just a few moments. But Paul likens this to our bodies and our lives and our existence being like earthen jars. Jars made of clay, verse number 7 tells us, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So we today are jars of clay. But there, if you back up a few words in that scripture, God has put a treasure inside of you. Now, if you research this, whenever they would store uh, things of great value and things of great, uh, great uh, wealth and, and prosperity, uh, things that they wanted to keep protected and preserved, they would put those things inside of an earthen jar and they would actually seal the top of that jar. And that way, the only way you could get inside of that jar to get the treasure out was to break the seal and to break the jar. When you look at a jar of clay on the outside, uh, it, it doesn't look very becoming in itself. It doesn't look like something of, you wouldn't know what was inside of it by the way it looked at on the outside. And that's the way it is with us. We can look at each other and we can think, man, there's not really anything that on the outside or in our lives or in our nature that bears any witness to, to the treasure that's on the inside of us. But you, and sometimes our attention is only on the outside. Sometimes we're very critical of ourselves or very critical of our surroundings. We're, we're good at looking at our bank account and looking at our house and looking at our appearance and looking at our, how many friends we have and looking at how people think of us. And, and, and we can think bad about ourselves and think that we're not significant. And how could God use me? Or, I, or even, I've messed up too much. I, I've went too far. But can I tell you, when God looks at you, He does does not see the jar of clay on the outside. He sees the treasure that's on the inside of you that he's got to do what it takes to get it out. Amen? That's why we go through trials. That's why we go through tests. That's why we go through storms and persecutions because God has got to get the treasure out of you. And that's what I want you to see here this morning. Amen? There are physical things that we go through. There are spiritual things that we go through. The physical affects the spiritual. The spiritual affects the physical. Everything in this life, good or bad, that you experience, it affects and shapes your mind. It shapes your consciousness. It shapes how you think and, and who you are. What you go through, what you've went through in this life, what you're going to go through in this life is linked not with who you are, but who you are meant to be. How many believe that this morning, that God means for you to be more than you are right now? I mean, I'm not talking about riches and status. I'm talking about things in eternity now. I'm talking about the eternal glory that God has prepared for you. The role that He has for you in His kingdom. God has more for you than you're walking in right now. And so what God allows you to be tested with, what God allows to come against you, allows to happen, or even directs to happen, God does it because it's linked with who you're meant to be. I, I can think back over my life, and, and I've had a good life. I had a, a good childhood. Uh, there's been some rough seasons in my life, that hard things in church and all that. You know all those things. When I look back over my life, even the bad choices that I've made, the tears and the hurts and pains. I cannot separate who I am today from what I've been through. Did you know that? Who you are today 
cannot be separated from what you've went through. Because what you've went through has made you who you are. Your childhood, the way you were raised, your education, your experiences, they have made you who you are. They cause you to think the way that you think. Amen? If I had not gone through some of the things I went through, I would be a different person than I am today. Yeah, you think back on some things and you may have wished that that wouldn't have happened. And if you could go back, you'd make a different decision. But if you really think about it, if you were able to go back and change what happened and what you went through, it would change who you are. If I hadn't gone through it, I wouldn't be a, I'd be a different person. And I don't know about you, but I, 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 I strive every day, every week, every month, and every year to be a better man than I was before. I hope that as 2018 draws to a close, that Daniel Gamble is a better husband, a better father, a better brother, a better son, a better pastor, a better man than I was on January 1st, 2018. I can tell you that I'm a different man than I was. Some of the things that God was working on me on, talking to me about, mysteries of His Word, some of those things that I couldn't fully grasp and I was praying and seeking about, I can look back now, you don't necessarily realize it in the moment, but I can look back now and I can realize and see that everything I went through this year was Bringing those things into fulfillment and fruition in my life. Amen. And it's the same with you, whether you realize it or not. Whether you've progressed or digressed, the same is with you. See, sometimes it's not even about the thing you go through. Sometimes it's not about the thing. Sometimes it's about the season. You know, I always... I don't know if you do this or not, but uh, um, hang on just one moment. I don't know if you do this or not, but when you, when, you, when you get up in the morning and you got somewhere to be and you can't find your car keys, which is a regular occurrence for me at my house, um, I can't find my car or church or anywhere. Uh, Carrie's truck is still parked out behind the church because I can't find her key. So I not only lose my key, I lose other people's keys. So don't ever give me your keys. But, but you know, I always say, uh, you know, when I'm late, well, you know, maybe, maybe this kept me from being in an accident this morning. You ever, you ever done anything like that? And that could be so. Uh, and I always say, but God, you know, you could have kept me out of an accident without making me lose my keys. <laughs> and so sometimes we can try to find a specific reason or purpose or whatever for every little bitty thing. Sometimes... Things just happen. And sometimes it's not about the thing, but it's about the season you go through. Some of you may be going through a trying season. Some of you may be going through a dry season. Some of you may be going through a season where you're not hearing from God like you used to. Some of you might be going through a season where everything is great and good and God's answering prayers and, and, and things are just awesome. What you go through teaches you not only who God is, but it reveals who you are. Think about it. God already knows who you are. God already knows what you can handle. God knows you better than you'll ever know yourself. God not only knows every decision you've ever made, God knows every decision you ever will make. Every mistake, every fault, every wrong turn, God knows it all. God knows the number of hairs on our head. He knows how many hairs got ripped out this morning when you brushed your hair. He knows how many hairs are going the way of male pattern baldness. He knows. God's good at addition and subtraction. God knows it all. But God allows us to do these things to reveal who we are to ourselves. God already knows you. He has to show you who you are. God already knows what you can handle. He wants to show you what you can handle. Paul went through a lot of mess. He went through a lot of trials. Beat with rods. Stoned to death. 
It's on near to death at least. We don't know if he died, but uh, that's a theory. Uh, put in prison, shipwrecked, bit by snakes. Had to be let down from a wall in a basket because people tried to kill him. Suffered for the calls of Christ in the gospel. But even though he went through all of that, he was able to say, We are afflicted, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Why was he able to say that? Because it continues on in the scripture. He says, always carrying in the body of death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what had been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe. And so also we speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. What Paul is saying here is that we are going to die day by day so that we can be who we are meant to be. So that who we're meant to be can spring forth in the fullness of revelation and power. The old man has to die so the new man can live. The old cloth has to be thrown away so that the new skin can be made. Amen? The old man has to die so I can be born again a new creature in Christ Jesus. Some people don't mind change. But as a rule, a general rule, the human race doesn't like change. We like consistency. But really that's a mirage. That's a fantasy. Because the only thing that's things that are constant in this life are God, taxes, death, and change. Everything changes. Who you are today will die and give way to who you're going to be tomorrow. And it's been that way every day of your life. The question is, is are we going to go about this in the flesh? Are we going to digress and go in the wrong direction? Or are, is that new birth, that rebirth, that recreation, that new renewal, is that going to happen from God? Verse 15, Paul says this, For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Even the hard times you've went through, even the times that you thought, God, what are you doing? God did those things for your sake. In verse 16 through 18, I like this verse. It says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I don't know what that does for you this morning, but that excites me. What's on the inside of you? What is that eternal treasure that God is trying to get out? What's on the inside of you? You know, I said at the beginning of the service and said I'd reference it again. You know, we've been going through a rough patch. Not only here at Cross Life Church, but in the lives of believers. Almost everybody here, in fact, I'd probably say all of us, this year, this has been a tough, rough year for us. Pain, sickness, loss, divisions, divisions in families, 
medical problems and issues, financial shortfalls, loss of loved ones. We even been hacked. Uh, computer systems attacked and hundreds of hours of videos that were being produced for the spread of the gospel, almost ready to be released, all deleted. We've been under attack this year. But I can tell you that not only am I a different man because of what I've went through, we're a different church because of what we've went through. And we'll keep going through it as individuals or as a corporate body until we are positioned to where God wants for us to be. Amen? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm about ready for a season of renewal. You know, this, this hard season, this dry season is getting a little old. I'm ready for renewal and refreshing, and, and, and I'm ready for the revival side of things. You know, I... Uh, I've seen enough of the valley. I'm ready for the mountaintop. And I believe that it's going to happen soon. And I, and, and, and I believe that that's the reason why I started to, to look it up on how many times it's, it is. But over and over in the scriptures, both the old and the new, God exhorts his people not to be dismayed, not to grow weary in well-doing. Don't grow tired of doing what's right. Don't get discouraged. Be encouraged because God knew that sometimes we'd be in the valley. God knew sometimes we'd go through trials. God knew that sometimes there'd be things that did not make sense. God knew as the psalmist wrote in Psalms 42 that sometimes our soul would be cast down and it would be disquieted in us. God knew those things. That's why he said keep your hope in God. Don't grow weary in well-doing, but he that endures unto the end shall overcome and be saved and get a reward. But I want to ask you today, think of all the things you've went through, the trials and tests and storms and, and, and just the, the mess that the enemy's tried to stir up. Think about that. Think about it now from this perspective. What is inside of you that is of such value? That your heavenly father would allow pain and trial into your life to excess it out of you. Think about that. Sometimes I have to, to punish my children. And I hate it. And I probably they probably get away with a lot that they shouldn't because of that. Can somebody say amen? I know the Bible says spare the rods, pull the child, and all that. But I, I hate to do it, but sometimes I do. Do you think that God likes it when we go through trials? I don't think God likes it when we lose loved ones. I don't think God likes it when we are laying in our bed at night, not able to sleep because of the stress and the worry. I don't think that God likes it when we're sick and have pain in our bodies. I, I don't think God likes it when divisions comes and when persecutions come and tests and storms. I don't think God likes that. There has to be something of great value in you. That God, your heavenly Father, who loves you more than I could ever, we could ever love our children would allow you to go through that pain in order to pull it out. That more than anything shows you your worth, shows you your value. In chapter 5, verse number 1 through 5, Paul switches metaphors a little bit. He Stops talking about jars of clay and he starts talking about tents. He says, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for the, this very thing is God. 
who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Amen. I like that metaphor. That this life that we build for ourselves, this, this body, this existence, the great gift that it is from God. Life is a precious gift. But yet there's something on the inside of us that groans for something more. But Paul says that the reason why we know that this suffering is only going to be temporary, that the test only is going to be temporary, is because God has given us the Holy Spirit as a down payment. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee that one day soon the funds are going to be released. Those of you who, who are saved and you've communed with the Spirit, what an awesome thing it is to have the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. The, we couldn't make it without Him, but the Holy Spirit, even the Holy Spirit's present in our life, is still just a taste. It's just the tip of the iceberg. It's the down payment on what God has for you. So we are always of good courage, the scripture says. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Good or evil. Suffering draws many to God. But it also sometimes pushes people away from God. The reason why it pushes people away from God is because they have a... They've centered their focus on themselves and their temporal happiness. They focused on their, on their, their, they put their focus on the state of their being. It's all about them. And as long as things are going good and as long as things are great and prosperous and plenteous, oh, they'll love the Lord. But they're... But then if God does not prevent something that upsets this happiness, then they no longer have a need or a desire from God. But when you focus, when the center of your focus is on the sovereign plan and will of God, upon that which is eternal rather than the temporal, in other words, when you focus on the fact that God is all-powerful, He's all-knowing, He's ever-present, He's always been and always will be, and He probably has a good idea of what He's doing when you focus on the eternal thing and not the temporary situational day-by-day -day things down here. That even when things go bad, your faith will still be in God. When things go good, your faith will still be in God. When you put it, it, when you put your faith in the eternal, it changes the way you view things. It's then that you will finally understand that God works all things for the good of them that love Him and keep His commandments. It's then that you understand that this light affliction is going to work for me a greater way to glory. It's then that you understand that God gives beauty for ashes and strength for fear, the oil of gladness for mourning. It's then that like Job, you can say the Lord gives and He takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. It's then that you can say that though he slay me, yet will I serve him, yet will I trust him. It's then that you can say naked came I in and naked I will go out. But blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want to tell you this morning, God's got to get the treasure out of you. Job went through what he went through. Not only for the double portion, but Job went through what he went through. So that 4,000 years later, on November the 11th, 2018, at Cross Life Church in Moxfield, North Carolina, at 
at 11.36 a.m. in the morning, you could hear of God's faithfulness and power that it does not matter what you've went through or what you're going through. God shall see you come out on the other side and to know that just as it was with Job, it too is with those who love and trust the Lord. And I want to tell you today that God was not only working in your life for you but he's working in your life so that if he tarries long enough for a thousand years from now somebody else can look back over the testament of your life and know that God has never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread if you believe that can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning now thank the Lord there ain't going to be 4,000 years left. That was just hyperbolic language. Amen. I wouldn't mind if he came back today. Somebody say amen to that. So we do not lose heart. The scripture says we do not lose heart. That though the outward man may waste away, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Weeping may endure for the night. But joy is coming in the morning. And Psalms 42, one of my favorite Psalms. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so, my, so pants my soul for you, O my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in the procession of the house of God. With glad shouts and songs of praise. A multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon and of Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By day the Lord commands His steadfast love, and at night His song is with me. A prayer to my God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all the day long, where is your God? But why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. The psalmist is saying here, sometimes he gets depressed. Sometimes he gets down. Sometimes he doesn't understand what God is doing. Sometimes the things that people say against God make sense. Oh, you didn't expect to hear that this morning. It may make sense to the natural mind, to the flesh. But the psalmist said, I cannot give in to those things because I know who God is. I know what his purposes are. And I know that he will do what's best for me. And so I hope in God. That's what he's saying. I want to tell you this morning. The treasure in you has got to come out. The pot, the earthen jar, the jar of clay that is the life and the person and the body and everything that, you know, God's got to break that to get the treasure out. And he does it because he loves you. Because he knows that even though it's going to hurt for just a little while, that even though the affliction's going to be there, that compared to the weight and the value of the treasure that's inside, 
it's worth it all. We know in the anointing oil, Candy, as you come and play softly, that the way that they would get the oil from the olives was from crushing it. And they would take the olives and there was a, a round trough that had in it a millstone that had a log of wood that ran through the middle of it. And they would attach that to a donkey or an oxen or whatever they would use. And that beast of burden or even a human being, this is what Samson did except for corn, would walk around that trough over and over again in a circle. And that millstone would crush those olives and the oil would, would trickle down into the bottom and, and come out of a little trench into a collecting jar. And then they would take the olives that were left after they had gotten all the oil out that they could by that way. They would take them and they would put them in a special basket. And they would take it over to what is called the Gethsemane stone. The Gethsemane is a large stone that is about the height of, of me. A little ways around and just a heavy stone. There is a Gethsemane stone that has been found in his own display in Capernaum in Israel even to this day. And they would take that basket, they, they through a pulley system, would, would lift up that heavy stone, that Gethsemane, that olive press. They'd place that basket underneath it and then they would let the stone down and the weight of that stone would crush those olives even more. And as they crushed those olives, the oil would run out into a trench. And I, I believe it was in this part of the process that that was actually the purest and most valuable of the oils. Jesus Christ, our anointed one, was crushed in the garden of Gethsemane, the garden of the olive press. You can't get out that which is valuable and without that, out that which is precious. You can't get it out without a pressing and without a crushing. And as hard as it is, as difficult as it is, some of us have been praying for God to take us to another level. To give us a greater anointing, a greater understanding. Maybe even to take us back to a state and a place that we've been in God before. Before when you prayed that prayer, but what you were praying was, God, crush me. God, break me. Crush me and press for me that which is of value, that treasure. Now I can tell you, Londo raboko shando rabahu naya, bo raboko na mandi sindo rabon, barredno no mo shando rabahun, bero kundo toi, brasondo rain, mando rabun da rain, sandi na nande im. Bandeya sondorein mai kai shayundo rondo rayun mai lon mane londo rabon yesabano kaine ida mande sin boro kai varundo khutai so Rande mo mamba kasotareid, 
dadando rande yun brundo rabakoso tarianda rabakataina korakadai kranda rakachea bodora bandida la maie de shein mai maian de shein maien de shein Barriera l'anno, ma chi ne rebe? Caia e a tai, era caia e a ranai, era ranai e de a nanai, o dorra baisha darianda rabai. My children. My creation, the apple of my eye, thou whom my soul loveth, my bride, my love, I come to you this hour. I come to you with an important message and an important word. I come to you with a heavy heart. I come to you with a brokenness in my spirit, for I have longed to dwell with you. I have longed to commune with you. I have longed to bless you. I have longed to use you. But there are those that have strayed from my will, strayed from my commandments. You have walked away from what you know is right and from what you know is true. You have spat upon my word. I have become of no effect to you, says the Lord. You have crucified me again and put me to open shame. Because you have tasted of my love. You have tasted of the sweet Holy Spirit. You have tasted and known my goodness and my great pleasure, declares the Lord. But you have traded it. The things of this world, you've compromised it for your own desires and your wicked desires and your fleshly needs. I cry out to you this day, hearken unto my word, declares the Lord. For there is a treasure that is inside of you, a destiny that I have prepared for you, and I will crush you. And I will press you, and I will break you. I will try you in the fire over and over and over again until the sin is purged from you, declares the Lord. Surrender to me. Repent. Hearken once again unto my words. I cry unto thee. My spirit bears witness with your spirit this day. And I say to my church, to my bride, do not grow weary in well-doing. Think not that I have forgotten about you. Think not that I have forgotten you. Think not that I have forsaken you or left you out to dry. I have not failed you, declares the Lord. For I tell you, I work all things according to the counsel of my will. And there are things that you do not understand. They're beyond your comprehension. But know that as it declares in my word that I will work all things for the good of them that love me, who keep my commandments and walk in the ways of righteousness and truth. But I declare unto you this day, I declare unto you now in this hour, that the day of testing is drawn to a close, that the hour of blessing is near, that the sun is about to arise on the horizon. I tell you, I come, and when I come, I shall come with healing in my wings. Do not grow weary. Mount up on wings like eagles, run, not grow weary, walk, and not faint. For those who wait upon me, declares the Lord, you shall renew your strength. I tell you that the things that I have spoken to you, 
The things that I have spoken to your church, every promise, every word, it shall all come to pass. And I reiterate once again to you that that which I do in you, for you, and through you will be greater than you can imagine. I tell you that no one will be able to get the glory for it. Only me, declares the Lord. And I tell you, it's coming soon. Walk, walk, walk according to the commands of your Father. Hearken unto the word of your Father who draws you to me, declares the Lord Jesus Christ. Obey me, repent, return to me, and I promise you, you'll never regret it. I promise you that which is broken, that which is stripped away, cannot even compare to what shall remain saith the Lord of hosts. Can we just reverence the Lord this morning? Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, whatever it takes, get the treasure out of me. Get the treasure out of Cross Life Church. God, whether here this morning or listening by live stream, I pray, God, that whoever and however the Holy Spirit spoke to, that they would hearken unto the voice of their Father, their Adonai, this morning. Can you just stand all over the house if you're not already? Just lift your hands in reverence the Lord for just a moment. Listen, the altars are open this morning. If you need to come, I thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for your promises. I thank you for your blessings, oh God. God, if there's something I'm not doing, if there's something we're not doing that we need to, Lord, I pray that you'd speak it to us this day. God, if we're being disobedient, if we're, if we're not sold out as much as we should, God, maybe even with the best intentions, if we've gone astray, Lord, Get us back on track this morning. Help us to know that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. God, I pray that today that we would all leave encouraged by the word, that we would not lose heart, that though the outward man may waste away, our inward man's being renewed day by day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And amen. Does anybody, if we haven't already, we'll transition to the altar part of the, the live stream for just a moment. But does anybody need prayer this morning before we pray about our prayer requests? This prayer requests, the Spirit of the Lord's here this morning. God's got to get a treasure out of you. Amen. Some of you might not even known or thought or believe there was a treasure in you, but there is. There he is. Anybody at all. Amen. Can we give the Lord one more hand clap of praise in this morning? 